Welcome to a very special pre-Oscars edition of The Point. I'm actually really excited by this one. First of all, I've got three fantastic Point videos for you guys. Mimi Kennedy, who was one of the stars of Midnight in Paris, which is an Oscar-nominated movie, uh, actually sent in a point about how Hollywood exports violence abroad. It's a really interesting point. Then Jordan Zacharin, who is a writer for the Huffington Post, he's their uh, entertainment editor as well, uh, sent in a point about the cozy relationship between the film industry and the Pentagon. I can't wait to talk about that. And then our third point uh, brings us back to 1973 for possibly the most controversial moment in Oscars history. And we've got a great panel here for you guys. Mike Farrell, of course, uh, is known for his roles in MASH, Providence, Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, and of course for his activism, including on the death penalty, which we've discussed several times. Great to have you here, Mike. Thank you. And Ed Rempel uh, is uh, a historian and the author of Progressive Hollywood, a People's Film History of the United States. And of course, our friend Tina Dupuy uh, is a syndicated columnist and the managing editor of CrooksandLiars.com. All right, so our first video is from Mimi Kennedy, and uh, it's brilliant. Let's watch. My name is Mimi Kennedy, and I'm an actress. I'm also an activist and chair of Progressive Democrats of America. Uh, my point is that as an actress, I would like to be proud of the United States exports to other country and our homegrown stories that we tell to ourselves and each other in the United States. And I think it's time for Hollywood to admit that the easy storytelling of mass random violence and force as being the only story, the only way to win a conflict, has really been toxic for uh, world culture. And I would hope in this period after the real wars uh, and still ongoing, the blood in the streets that we see in so many places and the blood we haven't seen in places like the Congo that has been horrendous, we would say enough is enough. There is that blood, bodies are maimed, bodies are blown apart. We could go on seeing it forever and it would just numb us. We need stories about surviving this terror and processing it. No more mind-numbing body gore violence. Let's have better imagination. I will say one thing. Globally, it's very difficult to translate beautiful language stories. And that's been a reason I think people hit on the head and ha 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 for comedy or tragedy. It's legible to people. But Shakespeare is translated into almost every language and seen everywhere. We understand each other's cultures better now. This is a time to start telling different stories and not relying on the physical blood and gore that only numbs us. Let's lift our stories up start identifying, feeling compassion, mutual feeling, telling those stories, stop the numbing stuff. We need something better. And that's my point. And um, you can catch me in Midnight in Paris or Five Year Engagement. Those are comedies. I hope they have some elevation. And uh, pdamerica.org if you want to get active inside the system as we have it now and really make an effective change so that we can survive and live with dignity and compassion with each other. All right, Mike, uh, do you agree with her that uh, Hollywood is producing, distributing these movies that are contributing to violence throughout the world? Oh, sure. Um, but, you know, we have to remember that this is a business and Hollywood will, can, will make movies about whatever will sell. Uh, so, I agree. I mean, I, I think I like Mimi, and I think that her her point is uh, is is a is a good one, a, a bit unrealistic, uh, in my view. Um, I actually totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love her for it, but yeah, sure. uh, but uh, is I mean, Tina, is this part of what sells? Is that is that why we're doing it here? Well, I, I also love Mimi, uh, but I would disagree with the premise. Uh, I think that there are a lot of foreign films that are incredibly violent. I think that there are a lot of uh, other countries that are incredibly violent. I don't think that has anything to do with what we're exporting. I mean, of the you know, uh, 2,500 movies that are made per year, only 500 or 600 are American films. Uh, and a lot of those other films from other countries are, you know, are not, uh, let's say, uh, uplifting, uh, to use one of her words. So I, I, I just, I disagree with the premise. However, I love when people are way more liberal than I am, and <laughs> I just, I want to celebrate that. I want to encourage them to talk. Right. Uh, but you know, to me, it's like uh, what it reminds me of is the Hayes Code. 
Um, it reminds me of censorship. It makes me very nervous uh, to like, so how do we implicate this? Like trying to inspire people to make better films? Absolutely. Right. But trying to keep people from making films that are violent, stay away from my zombie films. <laughs> I didn't get the impression she was trying to tell people what they couldn't do. I think she was trying to say, let's lift it up. And, uh, and that makes sense. I think we all, I've made a number of pictures, and I think my partner and I always tried to find a way to make a picture about human beings and human interactions and do it in a way that made a, made a point to people that was, I think, of value. Sean Penn once said to me in conversation, films should either be life-affirming or li uh, films either are, he said, life-affirming or life-denying. So I think there's a place for violence in motion pictures and television, as we see. Um, but I think the, 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 the concern should be about what the ultimate point of it is. Right. And by the way, whenever I want to have someone uh, give me an, uh, an opinion more liberal than mine, I bring Mike on. Awesome. So, <laughs> <laughs> so can I get a liberal perspective on this, Ed? I think that Mimi has a, an excellent point, And I think it's part and parcel of US imperialism. They have to desensitize people at home and abroad to violence. When uh, Americans cover the wars in, in the Middle East, it's filled with the whiz-bang gadgetry of the drone missiles and, oh, look at the shock and awe and all this. When Al Jazeera covers it, it's more like, look at the suffering of human beings. Violence does have a place in the movies. MASH, for example, was uh, known for uh, being very bloody, especially the original movie, the uh, surgical unit and so on. And that was quite shocking around 1970 or so. But it, it's not just showing violence, it's how you show it to denigrate people, to rob their dignity, to rob their humanity. It's just a video game. Just press a button, wipe them out. You could sit somewhere in the continental United States, press a button, and kill civilians on the other side of the world in Pakistan or something like that. I, I think yeah. there's some interesting points there. I mean, in terms of desensitizing the actual violence on the ground, it looks like a video game. So can I just ask you, do you agree with Tina at least that, look, we have the ability to make those kind of movies because we have these high production uh, values, et cetera, et cetera, that if the French or the Indonesians or whoever else could, that they would probably make similar movies? Well, I don't think that violent movies are solely an American uh, domain, but I think it's sort of a house specialty. <laughs> and uh, and our, our TV shows, how many of our TV shows are uh, cop dramas? It, it's totally disproportionate to our, our daily lives, the amount of the, these programs that deal with this uh, constant uh, titillation through mindless sex and, and even more mindless violence. And, and so uh, I do think that Mimi has, has an excellent point. <clears throat> it's also because a lot of these filmmakers are not gifted enough to be able to generate stories about human conflict the way that maybe the French director Francois Truffaut did, by just the interaction between people. They've got to show um, high drama by shooting somebody, as if daily life doesn't have an, enough of its own tensions and so on. Well, you know, I, I, th I think, first of all, um, I, I agree with many of the points you've made, Ed, but, but you, you suggested at the outset, I think, that, that's, that, this is, that there's a purpose to this, that we are uh, doing, that these messages are being put out there for a reason. Uh, I think that gives much too much credit to the people in the that. industry. Um, <laughs> much too much credit. I mean, they want to make movies and, and they want to make money. Um, uh, I personally would prefer if there was a more human connection in films, even, the, even the, what we would call the violent films, as I said, I think, earlier. But to suggest, if you did, that it is part of an American propaganda move, I, I disagree with that entirely. But I, I also disagree that, uh, that watching these things dehumanizes us. Um, I, I interviewed a guy, he's been sleeping, he was sleeping in McPherson Park in, at Occupy DC, uh, an Iraq war vet. And it wasn't until, and he grew up playing video games and he was totally raw, I mean he was 11 years old when the towers fell. Uh, he's 21 years old now. Uh, he kind of, he watched these films his entire life. And it wasn't until the WikiLeaks 
uh, video of the Apache helicopter mm -hmm. shooting down, you, we're all familiar with this, that he was able to actually see war. I mean, he was there on the ground uh, and he was completely desensitized to it. And so it was actually seeing the video of these images that changed his his mindset and he became an activist. So I don't think, I mean, I think it's kind of, it's, it's arrogant to presume that there is only one thing for violence and that is to do, you know, uh, to make us uh, uh, desensitized to it or to make us better soldiers or whatever. I think that uh, we are all scared of our own mortality and that's what violence is. And so in, in that way, it is rather attractive because it's so, uh, it's such a base fear that we have. So can I throw one more thing out here to you guys? Uh, you know, some have the theory that it encourages violence and others have the theory that it's a good outlet so that, that mm -hmm. it actually causes less violence. You know, it, in the, they have the same debate about the porn industry. Does it create, you know, a more aggression towards women or maybe less? Uh, and w what's your take on that? I, you know, because I, I'm, I'm a little torn on that. I mean, I like my violent movies too, but on the other, you know, on the other hand, I can see how some maybe drive people over the edge. It could affect different people in different ways. Human beings are wired differently. They're raised differently by different family units or a lack of. Um, and, and also, uh, just getting back to an earlier point, it's not just showing violence. It's how the violence is framed. It's how you show it. In 1925, the great Soviet director, Sergei Eisenstein, made probably the most violent scene in non-slasher movie history in Battleship Potemkin, the famous Potemkin step sequence when the Cossacks slaughter innocent civilians. That was done as an outcry against violence and against oppression. You could also frame violence in such a way, and we're going to deal with that in a future segment, uh, as to being propaganda to promote desensitization of the masses of people so that the war machine can um, flow more easily. I think if you look at the data, we have more violent video games than ever before. Our crime rate's down, but our obesity rate is up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that it makes them, I think that it makes them fat. <laughs> Not violent. They're too out of that's shape what, to That's what the data is telling us. Right. Uh, you can have a causation uh, argument, but uh, we can look at the numbers. There is, there is a desensitization that's going on. Whether it's coming from motion pictures and television or not, there is a desensitization that's happening, I think. And it's happening, uh, and it's visible. In, in our society, in the way we react to each other, in the way we now accept much of what's coming at us on television. And part of it, and I go to television far more than I do go to the motion pictures, actually, in terms of responsibility, because it's a question of uh, pushing the edge of the envelope. That's become the kind of uh, cause of the industry of the moment. How risque, how sensationalized, how ugly, how, what can you get away with? kind of is what's happening. And I do think that that has a, uh, a really uh, uh, a negative effect. You know, my last point on this is that it's not just television. I think specifically news has desensitized us more than anything else, including mm. the movies. Mm. When CNN made war look like a video game, right. I think that's when we forgot that there are people at the end of those bombs, mm. and some aunts, some uncles, grandmothers, little kids who die at the end of those bombs. Now, when we come back, we're going to discuss how the Pentagon is influencing movies. If you don't know this, it's amazing what they do to influence movies. And there I think we'll get a lot more progressive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so come right back. All right, we're back on the point, and our next point is sent in by Huffington Post Entertainment Editor Jordan Zacharin, and he's talking about how the Pentagon secretly influences the movie industry. This is really interesting, watch. Hi, my name is Jordan Zachern, and I'm a writer and editor for the Huffington Post. Here's my question. At what point does entertainment become military propaganda? This coming weekend, a movie called Active Valor is going to hit theaters. You may have seen commercials for it during the Super Bowl, touting that it has active duty Navy SEALs starring in the film instead of actors. What you may not know is that the movie originally came out of the Navy as a recruitment video. They decided that, hard hit by the wars in the Middle East, they needed to up their image and get more recruits to the special forces. So the idea for a video came along, eventually became a feature film, and now millions of people next weekend and in the coming weeks are going to see this movie without quite realizing that it's supposed to play on their emotions more than really any other type of Hollywood movie. Then again, 
the military doesn't have much of a problem getting its message into movies already. You might have also seen an advertisement for Battleship, or maybe you were one of millions of people who saw Transformers. Now, those movies work closely with the military, as do many others, to get all the guns and ships and airplanes that you see that make the movie realistic. But the trade-off is they have to, you know, they have to vet their image with the military, and they don't give a positive portrayal, no toys. Now, at what point are we being tricked, and at what point is this okay? Another question is, why don't we look more into it? The military doesn't hide this fact, they even cat it on their website. Sometimes you even see reports about it. But it seems that it's not quite an issue uh, the way it should be, questions of free speech and First Amendment rights and all those other things. So, should we be discussing this more? Is it even a problem? Please discuss. We will, thank you. <laughs> so, Tina, uh, I think he has an excellent point. And this whole, I I'm gonna go over the top. The Active Valor movie actually, uh, I I'm gonna say it, it disgusts me, okay? And not for the, because of the Navy SEALs in it. Uh, um, they actually apparently in the beginning didn't even wanna be in the movie, right? And I feel bad saying that given that they're in the movie. But this, it feels to me like out and out propaganda. And, and it, it's, I don't, I hate it. You know, there's a long history of this with Hollywood and the Pentagon. I mean, uh, you can go back to, you know, Donald Duck fought the Nazis. Uh, Veronica Lake, famous for her peekaboo bangs, was asked by the Pentagon to put her hair back so Rosie the Riveter wouldn't blow her hair up. Uh, that's actually a true story. Uh, you know, we've, we've always kind of, because Hollywood is a propaganda machine, uh, it just is. I mean, it's, that, it's been that way for uh, uh, the gay movement. I mean, and go to anybody who's an activist and glad, and they will happily tell you the same thing, uh, that because of positive media portrayal images, it's, that's what has led uh, you know, uh, to homosexual rights and to m the majority of the public now being you know, fine with gay marriage, finally. It's been for two, you know, for two decades of this stuff. So yeah, uh, Hollywood is a powerful tool, and the military likes powerful tools. Yeah, no, I understand that. I don't think this that. is a shock. I uh, just, it's like, you want no, me to No, but I know? think, look, Ed, I think that uh, most people at home have no idea. I, I don't think they know the history of how the Pentagon has worked with the movie industry. I don't, like, Active Valor is the first one where they might get a sense, because they say, hey, we have active duty native Navy SEALs in it, and you think, Huh, that's strange. Well, this works hand in hand with the first segment. U.S. imperialism and militarism has to desensitize the masses of people in order to constantly, never ending, endingly, invade country after country after country that never attacks us. It goes hand in hand. The Pentagon has had an office in Hollywood, and this is how it works. I'll give you an example. Um, Black Hawk Down. Who was the godfather who got it made? Senator Jesse Helms, one of the worst segregationists in the U.S. Congress. I got this straight from the lips of Jerry Bruckheimer at the Egyptian Theater. And um, what happens is that the Pentagon will vet scripts, and if they approve of the way that the military is depicted, in a favorable way that will retain recruits and get new recruits and protect their appropriations on Capitol Hill, then they'll let you have low cost to free access to Pearl Harbor like Jerry Bruckheimer did for, for the movie called Pearl Harbor. They'll let you have access to their equipment and so on. If they don't like the depictions, you don't get those freebies. So the pro-war, pro-militaristic movies are subsidized by the Pentagon. Oliver Stone is an actual Vietnam veteran. He's never, ever gotten any military support for his anti-war films. Jerry Bruckheimer, I researched this. I never found that he ever served a moment in the U.S. military. I could be wrong, but I never found that he was in the military. He should have called Black Hawk down, Chicken Hawk down. Oh, wow. All right. Strong words. Mike, uh, how about MASH? Did you guys get authorization or no? No. No. We were, <clears throat> we were thought of as anti-military. Um, and, however, not by the military. Uh -huh. uh, by the brass. But, uh, you know, our whole point was thumbing our nose at dogmatic authority. So... That doesn't, go, that doesn't go down well with the military. <laughs> no. Uh, with the military high command. Um, but you know, I, I have to say, duh, you know? <laughs> if, if you're going to make a movie about a war and the military wants you to be uh, 
promoting the, their stuff, then of course they're going to support that. I agree with you. They've gone over the line with regard to this, this new thing where they're actually using real uh, military men. But, uh, you know. Uh, so, so, but the thing is, I feel like there has to be some sort of truth in advertising. And I don't, you know, to us, because we're in the industry to some degree, and you're, well, you're totally in the industry, <laughs> but, um, you know, we know that this is happening. I mean, but how many people at home know that it, the first movie to ever win an Oscar, Wings, was authorized by the military, okay, right. and that they uh, work with them? Etc. How, how many people know that there was the Office of War Information, yes. where there was the Bureau of Motion Pictures and the Office of Censorship, mm -hmm. right. and, and they worked with those companies? And then we still have the Film Liaison Office and the points that Ed was making. Yeah. And if you're a bad boy, then you don't get the aircraft carriers in your movie. Uh, but the question, Tina, is how do you solve it, right? How, or that's it. They're, they're never going to find out. In most of the cases, the kids who watch Transformers are going to have no idea that the uh, Pentagon is helping to feed propaganda to them about how glorious it is? Well, it's also, you know, I mean, in, in fairness, the, the C Navy SEALs have been big news. I mean, they have been big headlines. And so to have them in a movie, I, I got to admit, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'll just be the devil's advocate. But I also think that, you know, uh, movies are subsidized all the time by, say, you know, Michigan has movies that are filmed in Michigan and mm -hmm. they subsidize it heavily. Uh, there was a big, uh, a couple of years ago, the big story in Hollywood was that uh, we had runaway production and movies were not being filmed here because uh, all other states were heavily subsidizing. Everything was going to Canada and other parts of the, the states. And those movies depicted those states in a positive light. I mean, like I said, this is, it's a powerful tool, Hollywood. I just don't think that this is, uh, you know, I, I think that this is one of those moments like, okay, yeah, and I think that full disclosure, I'm always a fan of, but I, I just don't see it as, uh, you know, something nefarious. It is what it is. I mean, movies glorify all sorts of stuff. They also sell us all sorts of stuff. All right, well, then let me go over the top. I mean, so uh, the Germans during World War II also had their propaganda movies, and they glorified the German soldiers, and they were the greatest, and they were the best. Now, of course, the German government is not like our government, and it was, the whole point of that and the end goal of that was much more nefarious and was horrible, et cetera. We all agree with that. That's obvious, right? But they do propaganda films glorifying their soldiers. We do propaganda films glorifying our soldiers. Isn't that wildly disturbing? And I, I, again, I don't know what we're supposed to do about it. Oh, I, but I well, feel well, at least we got to educate the public on it. That's like saying Hitler was a vegetarian. Isn't vegetarian? Isn't really disturbing? You <laughs> no, know, just no, because the Nazis did it. Wait a second. Just because their, the Nazis, just because the Nazis did it, doesn't make the, everything that the Nazis did. You know, including you know having organic vegetables. Bad. Yeah, but, but look, this is how it works. Getting back to Black Hawk Down, which Ridley Scott said, if they hadn't gotten support from the U.S. military, it would have been called Apache Down. And um, it was based on a real incident in, I believe, Somalia. And what do you remember from that? The dead American soldiers being dragged in their underwear through the dust. Remember that? Why isn't it in the movie? Well, that's the deal you make. You take out what shows that we're vulnerable, that Americans are not invincible, that we could lose, that we could be killed. Take that out of the, out of the film because that won't help to recruit people to the military. So that's the trade-off that's made, and it's very dangerous. Well, I agree. If, if, the, if the Pentagon is dictating what the script says, then that's very dangerous. But the, you know, there are people making anti-war movies. Yes. And they're not going to get the cooperation of the Pentagon, right. I quite agree. But where would they expect to get the so Mike, cooperation let me add, of the Pentagon? So, Mike, let me drill down on that, though, because the Pentagon, if you're going to get their approval for a mm -hmm. movie, mm -hmm. actually does look at the script before uh, right. you start filming. I understand. And, then at, and at the end, in fact, for Hurt Locker, they withdrew their approval when uh, they added a scene to the movie, right, at, at, towards the end. Right. So they said, okay, we're not backing it anymore. Right. So for those movies that get the approval, aren't they state-sponsored propaganda? I mean, because exactly. they looked at the script before exactly. and after and, and unauthorized. I, I guess so, but it, it, they Hurt Locker was still released and it was still a hit. Yeah. So uh, you know, the 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 filmmaker has a responsibility in that. And and if you want to sell yourself to the military, uh, then you have to live with that. Dave Robb wrote a book called Operation Hollywood, and he argues in the book that this preferential treatment vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment is illegal, that there's been court cases where the government cannot give subsidies to people because they support their speech and then deny it to others. 
So this may actually be illegal. And by the way, the CIA has had an office in Hollywood, too, for similar type of vetting of film scripts. Now that's an interesting point, too, which, uh, which I hadn't considered. Uh, let me throw one thing uh, out here. Look, I know it's unrealistic. I know the Motion uh, Picture Association is never going to go for it. But w w do you guys think it would be decent policy if before a movie began, if it had the authorization of the Pentagon, that it said clearly this movie was authorized by the United States military. Truth in advertising. That's Absolutely. Fine by me. Yeah. Sure. By the USA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and look, people might look at that and go, yeah, oh hell yeah, US of A, all sure. right, here we go, our military, etc. And uh, and and what do you think of the of the directors that play ball? Hey, let's again and keep, well, keep it real. This can keep get it real. into a whole quagmire of the director's cut versus the studio <laughs> cut, <laughs> and like in whatever other guy that they brought in to like do to have add another scene. I mean that. I mean it's that this is will never stop. I mean, having uh, having veto power. You know, if you're going to be if you're going to play ball, that's what you do. You know, I mean, I, I just I. I think that I love that you brought this up. There are tons of films that are made every year, tons of them, and tons of them have anti-war sentiment. Tons of uh, uh, films are made that are not violent, that are different things. You can always not go see these films. You can always, you know, just kind of dismiss them. I never saw Black, Black Hawk Down. I also didn't see uh, uh, the uh, United 42. Was that what it was called? Because that seemed to me like really creepy war on terrorism propaganda. So, you know, I mean, you can always turn it off. Uh, I, you know, I, I had to sit through the entire Sarah Palin film, The Undefeated, all two hours of it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and that was propaganda. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm not moving to Alaska anytime soon. Well, so, I, I mean, was, it doesn't always work. Can I just add, that, 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 what the, the implication of what you've just said uh, is that, it, that um, personal responsibility has a lot to do with this. I don't want to blow my own horn, but I was, I was asked to do a film some years back about the Please Enola blow Gay. Your own horn. <laughs> <laughs> about the Enola Gay. Uh -huh. And they sent me the script, and they said, we'd like you to be, and I said, not only do I not want to be in your movie, to where you glorify killing hundreds of thousands of Japanese with this awful bomb, but I don't understand why you want to make this movie. And they said, you know, okay, we'll look for somebody else. Well, look, that's, uh, I think, the, the real way of handling a situation. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I've faced this in television. When somebody tells you to play ball and, and to toe the line, everybody's <laughs> got a responsibility at some point. Not to toot uh, your own horn. Right. No, but look, seriously, as an actor, host, director, producer, yeah. you got to say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to glorify this, and this yeah. isn't the right way to go. So uh, now let's take one more break here, guys. And, and when we come back, uh, we are going to discuss the most controversial moment in Oscars history. So come right back for that. All right, we are back on the point, and our third video is going to be about one of the most controversial moments in Academy Awards history. It was in 1973 when this happened. All right, Ed, you say this is the greatest political moment in Oscars history. Why? In, fa in fact, I put it on the cover of my progressive Hollywood book, along with a picture of Mike Farrell, <laughs> among others. And uh, what a wonderful thing, instead of slapping yourself in the back, and look how great I am, to take that one minute of time and to give it to the people who are the victims of genocide, the wiped out. Uh, victims of, a, of a manifest destiny, expansionism, to stand up for indigenous rights at the moment that Wounded Knee was going on and ask the people at Wounded Knee, how did they react to that? They were under tremendous pressure and it bucked them up. It lifted all their spirits up at Wounded Knee. What a great thing to do instead of getting up there and telling everybody how great you are, how wonderful you are, thank my agent, thank my manager. No, thank the indigenous people of this continent. So uh, you heard some people booing in the background there. Does anybody think that you know part of this was a publicity stunt, or do you all think Marlon Brando was absolutely genuine about it? He this? has a long history, going back to the 1950s, of getting arrested for Indian rights. 
This is nothing new for Mr. Brando. He was involved with the Black Panthers. He told Larry King that the best movie he was ever in was called Burn, about third world revolution in the Caribbean island that Brando co-starred in. And so this was nothing new for Mr. Brando. So you're voting publicity stunt. Absolutely. No, I'm kidding. But, in the but if it was, in the best possible sense. It raised awareness of this issue. And the image of the American Indians did improve afterwards. Dances with wolves, smoke signals, uh, powwow highway. We've had an advance in uh, the screen image of American Indians since that happened. And Maul and Brando helped to raise that image. I think that's quite right. I think what he did had a tremendous effect. And I think the audience's response was really interesting. The few people that started to boo were overwhelmed by the applause for the woman. I was very impressed with her. I thought she handled herself with dignity, mm -hmm. with grace. Um, it's not what I would have chosen to do were I Marlon Brando. And by the way, let me say that Paul Winfield was wonderful in Sounder. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, you know, that's funny because as I was watching that, I thought, oh, yeah, look at all the people who were in those movies. And yeah. then, and I also thought, man, she must have been so nervous before that speech. Oh, God. Can you oh, the courage that it takes to, to do that. No, no, she wasn't. The reason why is that Brando was writing it by hand at home right before the, the Oscar ceremony. She didn't have time to think about it. She ran with Brando's secretary named Alice to the Oscars, and they had their tickets, and they got in. So she said she didn't have time to get nervous. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you said you wouldn't have done that. I, I want to go back to that. No, no, Why not? I, 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 I don't, for me, it wouldn't have been the appropriate thing to do. You know, um, Michael Moore did what he did, and he got heat for it. Uh, I thought what Jane Fonda did when she got the Oscar for Clute was to say, there are, you know there are many things I might have to say, but it's not appropriate here and now. Uh -huh. no. But you know what, Tina, let me, let me go to that, because a lot of times people get heat for doing things at the moment. You remember the black athletes in the Olympics with the, the raised uh, black gloved hand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and people were furious about that at the time. But those are the moments we remember. We remember, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. Littlefoot coming out here. We remember the black athletes. And looking back on it, it's almost always seen in a positive light, I, I feel, even though it gets so much heat at the time. Right, well, I, and I think that's the reason why, because it got so much heat, because they had, uh, specifically those black athletes, had to give back their, they lost their medals. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, here are people, they won their their chosen contest, they stood up for a political issue, and their, their uh, award was taken away. They, you know, I mean, so of course we're gonna remember stuff like that. But, you know, I, I mean, I am probably not a good person to ask about this because I cover politics. So when I watch the Oscars because it's culturally relevant and I have to watch the Oscars, I always want them to be more political. Yeah. So you know, I mean, I, I thought that it was it was really you know when the uh, we invaded Iraq and, and and the only person who said anything was was Michael Moore and it was like everybody was going up and just kind of acting like everything was fine and and I know that you know this is appropriate and and whatever but I I just I find uh, when the Oscars are are so afraid. Of, of challenging themselves, it, 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 it makes it out to be uh, more of a, a ceremony to pat themselves on the back instead of celebrating what art is. And art is supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, and my bias is in favor of anything interesting versus what is not. <laughs> so right, that, like, right. if I it's awkward, it, wearing, yeah. yes. uh, if it's awkward, even better. If it's, you know, just don't make it dull, right? So it, whenever a moment like this happens, I think like, oh, great, okay, we had something to talk about. That's fantastic. It, it, but you know, I, I, to, to switch topics for a second, uh, his original point in that was how Hollywood covered Native Americans. And I think that is one of the best points that is rarely ever made. I remember, you know, I recently made this point on the Young Turks that when I was a kid and I was watching the cowboy and Indian movies, I was like, why are the Indians the bad guys? I don't understand. It, it seems like the cowboys are coming and taking their land. Why are they, they the bad guys? In fairness, those Indians were white guys. Okay, well, right, no, and some of them were Italian, some of them were Jewish, the actors, of course, right? right? But uh, do you think that this was the pivotal moment when that began to change, or had it already changed by that? It, it, it enormously raised people's consciousness, and I think that it did have a, a huge impact on a, a positive depiction of the indigenous people, and not only by white filmmakers, but in movies like Smoke Signals, by so-called American Indians themselves. Yeah. I just wanted to amend something. When I said I wouldn't have done it, 
I wouldn't have sent Sasheen Littlefeather. I'd have said it, if I thought, felt there was something appropriate to say, I'd have said it myself. Yeah, that was an interesting choice, too. That's yeah. true. He could have shown he up. He also didn't yes. accept the Oscar. Right. Yes. I mean, that was the... And that was an extra layer yes. of... Uh, it wasn't like she accepted yes. him for him. You right. know, right, right. She, Good he, point. Yeah. They uh, but, didn't accept it at all. But he wanted America to see the indigenous people. Yeah. Right. It, he did not want the glory for himself. It was like when Charlie Chaplin, at the nadir of human history in 1940, before America entered World War II, when the continent of Europe was almost completely overrun by the Nazis, when Stalin had an, a, a treaty with Hitler, Charlie Chaplin made the great dictator, and he upheld the, the little Jew, the little barber, as the hero of the movie. And it's a similar thing. Even though Chaplin played the little barber and he himself wasn't Jewish, his brother was half Jewish, he wasn't. It's an important thing to bestow this prestige and honor onto the oppressed groups themselves. All right, now I want to discuss one other thing. You know, uh, you, Mike, your book is called, Just Call Me Mike, A Journey to, uh, for, uh, to Actor and Activist, yes. right? And you, know, you get a lot of heat, and, and the conservatives are great at this. Oh, these Hollywood liberals. <laughs> yes. why, why would we ever want to hear from them? Why don't they just shut up? Until, of course, it's Ronald Reagan. Sure. And in which case, they're like, let's make him president. <laughs> well, Arnold. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, it's always about if they disagree. If yeah, they disagree right. with the point we make, then it's why should these Hollywood liberals have a chance to talk? Yeah. <clears throat> but it's really about the issue. It's, uh, it's always about the issue. Hollywood has been involved in politics for all these years, and, and appropriately so. We're... Just like plumbers and carpenters, we're supposed to have our rights as Americans to speak our mind. And if somebody gives us a podium, and it is part and parcel of the, uh, the, uh, the accoutrement of being a, a celebrity, then you use it either to sell soap or to magnify your own importance or to do some good. Right. And Tina, isn't this, look, we both cover the media. Isn't this part of the problem with the media that they never call them on their BS? So like when they're like, oh, these actors, why don't these actors shut up? So now next on the set, Chuck Norris. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, my thing personally, I don't care if I disagree with them. You know, I don't care if you're Charlton Heston or John Wayne or, you know, or my politics are different than your politics. That doesn't bother me at all. Uh, what bothers me is that when celebrities are just flat out incorrect. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jenny right. McCarthy would come to mind, uh, where, you know, I mean, every time a child dies of whooping cough in 2010, 2011, 2012, I would blame her for that because she's just wrong. The science is wrong, but since she's a celebrity, like you said, no one kind of fact-checked her for, you know, a decade. She's still able to go and, and, and denounce uh, the uh, denounce these uh, getting immunized, even though that that is quite literally killing people by not getting immunized. Uh, that is what when I have a problem with it, and that's when the system. It's like we don't have the setup to where we fact check celebrities. We just go, oh, isn't that cute? Something pretty, an actor is saying something, and they're for something. But it can be a force for good. I mean, if you look at Angelina Jolie, I mean, they're people who are activists. Um, I'm, I'm actually all for activists, just as long as they are factually correct. And my final point is, look, we have Mike uh, Farrell on the show every once in a while, Young Turks, et cetera, talking about the death penalty, not because he's a celebrity, but because he knows more about the death penalty than almost anyone I've talked to, right? He's and even then, been dead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God not. Um, and then on the other hand, you have celebrities like Hank Williams Jr. and Obama, right. come on, yeah. come yeah. on. Right. What is that? Is that an opinion? I don't even know what that means. So, so, you know, you have to use your mind to figure out what they're saying. Does it make sense or does it not make sense? And if you're worried about celebrities speaking on issues, let's, I, I debated Chuck Heston once on Larry King's show. I'd be happy to debate Chuck Norris or, you know, whoever they want to throw oh, up there. Oh, I like that. Throw it down. What do you got, Chuck? <laughs> okay, let's make that happen. And you know who's a, a conservative celebrity who I think uh, it, it actually comes across really way? well? Correct me if I'm wrong. Gary Sinise. Gary's a yeah, yeah. very bright guy yeah. Yeah. and very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I also thought, I was just having this discussion yesterday. I, Kelsey Grammer is a brilliant actor, and he's, I don't agree with him on a lot of things, but I never got a sense that he's hateful or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I just think he's conservative, and you know, right. and he wants lower taxes. He makes a lot of money. I get it. <laughs> yeah, right? That's fair. <laughs> right. All right. So this has been a great show. I want to thank everybody here. Of course, we want to thank Mimi Kennedy and Jordan Zacharin for sending in their points. And then I want to thank Mike Farrell, uh, whose book is Just Call Me Mike. 
Look at this, a journey to actor and activist. Take a shot of this. Oh yeah, there you go. And then, uh, of course, Ed Rampell and his book is Progressive Hollywood, a people's film history uh, uh, of the United States. And of course, Tina Dupuy, uh, not only syndicated columnist, but the managing editor of CrooksandLiars.com. I want to thank all of you guys for coming, and I am looking forward to the Mike Farrell versus Chuck Norris debate <laughs> that we will broadcast later. I'm getting some later. popcorn, let's do this. <laughs> okay, let's do this. All right, we'll see you next week. <laughs>